Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Monday evening live stream. My name is Julian. Today, we're going to be talking about Slavoj Žižek's theory of hysteria. One question that he recommends everybody should ask themselves, the problem of symbolic identification, and I'm going to try to provide you with a brief introduction to the Lacanian psychoanalytic theory of the subject who is supposed to know, as well as Slavoj Žižek's additions to the subject who's supposed to know, namely the subject who is supposed to enjoy and desire, and the subject, crucially, who is supposed to believe. This is also the Christmas episode, so Merry Christmas to those of you who are celebrating. Please do leave a comment letting me know where you're joining me from. I'm currently in a chalet-style Swiss slash German cottage in the uh, Black Forest, having a very lovely Christmas indeed. Merry Christmas to everybody uh, here in the live stream today. Of course, if you'd like to download all of my lectures, as well as the complete guide to Zizek, please go to www.patreon.com forward slash Julian Philosophy. Okay, so I want to dive right in immediately with an idea that I think is quite interesting. Basically, the philosopher Slavoj Žižek has an idea about symbolic identity and ideology, and you could summarize it like this. He basically says that everybody should be a little bit hysterical, that fundamentally the beginning of every critique of ideology starts with one simple question, namely the question, who am I? And specifically, why am I supposed to be what you want me to be? This is the problem of all ideology and symbolic identification is that it essentially creates a pre-established framework for you to identify with and through. It's like it tells you to be a father or a son or an artist, or you could be a soldier in the military or a banker. Essentially, the conceptualizations as to what we believe is a life worth living and how to live our lives is therefore something that is overdetermined by ideological symbolic propositions. Therefore, one of the fundamentally most important questions you can ask yourself in life is why should I be who you want me to be? And perhaps more specifically, why should I be doing what you want me to be doing? This means that essentially what ideology does isn't simply to give you a predetermined political framework but specifically an incentive structure as to how you should live your life. What is a life that is considered meaningful? What is a life that is considered worth celebrating? Or, from the perspective of international warfare, what is a life that is considered worth mourning or grieving? What lives matter? And so what I'm going to try to do in this lecture today is I'm going to try to break down the problem of symbolic identification, the importance of hysteria, the relationship of hysteria from a Lacanian position to obsessional neurosis. Why Zizek argues that hysteria is a feminine position, and yet why this isn't a bad thing. It's not a conservative argument he's making about supposedly hysterical women. In fact, it's quite the opposite. And finally, I want to introduce you to the Lacanian subject who is supposed to know, and why this is, I think, quite an interesting idea when it comes to education and ideology. But first of all, what is, what is symbolic identification? Well, a good starting point is actually the Althusserian idea of ideological interpolation. Louis Althusser was a, a structuralist thinker of the 1960s in France. And he came up with this idea, which he called ideological interpolation. And essentially what he meant is that in order to exist in society, you have to find yourself in relationship to the powers that be, the authorities. For example, let's say that you're going through TSA and you feel a little bit nervous. If you've ever asked yourself, why do I feel nervous when I'm going through TSA, even though you have nothing to conceal, then you understand the power of ideological interpolation. Because you are being treated as a potential suspect you start feeling like somehow you've already infringed upon the law. Like there's something suspicious about your actions. In fact, you might start feeling a little bit worried that maybe you look suspicious to the authorities, or if they ask you to search your bag, you'll immediately start thinking, what could there be in my bag that will label me as a suspect? In other words, 
The very framework, the symbolic identification of the authorities who are searching for a suspect, thereby makes you inhabit, without even wanting it, the role of suspect. You are a potential suspect even to yourself. This is, of course, why it's also so dangerous when people say that they're okay with surveillance because they have nothing to hide. Because the truth is that the very act of surveillance creates that which is hidden. By means of having an authoritative gaze upon your belongings and your person, you are therefore, by definition, always already hiding something. This means that the gaze already creates the thing upon which it is looking, even if it is not there. It's like the hunt for a suspect will create suspicious behavior because in the gaze of the surveillance, you appear not only suspicious to the other, but suspicious to yourself. And Althus has an interesting example of this. He says, let's say that there's a policeman in the street and he's chasing a suspect and there's a crowd and the policeman yells, hey, you there. Now, at this point, it might be that even though you're totally innocent, you turn around to look. After all, if a policeman yells, hey, you there, you might somehow think that there's something going on and so you want to look. This moment in which you recognize yourself in the call of the other, in other words, this you is a place that you inhabit, is the moment in which you step into ideological interpolation. What's key, therefore, from the perspective of Althusser, is that symbolic identification is never simply speaking imposed upon you. It always takes a subjective recognition in the act of interpolation. Hence why it is interpolation. It is something that occurs between two poles. Now, the primary example of ideological interpolation today has nothing to do with direct authoritative control. Rather, you can find it when it comes to advertisements. Think about how every time you look at an advertisement, the message, the construction, the creation of desire is being directed at you as a potential consumer. This is one of the shifts in an authoritarian society. We have the individual, the subject, as the one who is ruled. But within a capitalist consumer society, nobody is directly, overtly ruled over and said the subject is supposed to be the one who watches himself, who rules over himself. Think about the ads that tell you that you should eat healthy or that you should buy supplements or you could buy a sleeping aid. Anything that will make you happier, healthier, more productive, etc. The creation of the ideal productive subject who is supposed to be happy is therefore the way in which your desire is structured. You recognize yourself in the imaginary dream, which is posited. This is why Schopenhauer was very accurate, I think, when Schopenhauer said that anytime somebody wants to sell you something, they're not selling you a product, they're selling you yourself. And this is true for contemporary branding as well. Branding most of the time isn't trying to sell you a product but by means of convincing you that it is a superior product. Instead, they're selling you a lifestyle. They're essentially selling you, as Schopenhauer would say it, a dream. The product is you. That when you're sold something, especially if that thing is free, then essentially you are the product. That the idea is that if you consume this product, you are therefore working on yourself. You're optimizing yourself, etc. What's important here is that ideology is therefore not simply, once again, a political framework. It's not which party you vote for. Ideology is the symbol, uh, is a system, sorry, ideology is the system of symbolic identifications by means of which we see ourselves as real, as existing in the world, as being a person. Now, the reason this is important for Zizek is that he says that hysteria is therefore the primary form of all critique of ideology. If the central question of all hysteria is, who am I? And why should I be who you want me to be? You're therefore essentially already critiquing ideology. You're critiquing the incentive structures and the modes in which the subject is created or interpolated symbolically by means of questioning your own participation therein. Why should I work the way you want me to work? Why should I present the way you want me to present? 
And this is why anyone who goes against what is considered the status quo, whether it's identification on a sexual level, whether it's identification on an artistic level, anybody who resists by means of their own life and what they choose to do with it, the previously established status quo of what is considered acceptable is therefore considered a risk. That fundamentally the question, who am I and who would I like to be, is therefore already a small act of resistance because it leads you to the notion that you might not want to do or be what other people want you to be. Now, of course, this is where ideology within contemporary capitalism reveals itself as being particularly clever because essentially what it posits is that you should ask yourself this question every day, that everyone should wake up in the morning and think to themselves, what is the dream life I would like to live? What kind of billionaire existence would I like to have? Hence why we have this new genre of online content that essentially says, here are the habits of the wealthy that you can adopt in your own life. Here's how you can read like Bill Gates, or here's how you can think like a billionaire. And yet fundamentally, even though this presents itself to you as being an act of aspirational education, it really just reinforces the previously established incentive structure. Essentially, what you're being told is that if you find the outward modes of behavior of the elites, that you too will become like the elites. What this doesn't reveal are the structural manners in which the elites didn't become elites precisely by those mechanisms that are being sold to you, reading more, etc. They became elites because of the structural imbalances and justices and inequities that are built into the very system itself. Therefore, the very fantasy that you too could have access to this level of wealth and power is precisely what allows this truth to be concealed. To put it in another way, what is being hidden is that there is nothing to be hidden. What is being kept from you is precisely that there is no secret to being rich other than the structural inequity that allows the so-called 1% to remain rich precisely at the cost of everybody else believing that they're on the up and up. That most people don't consider themselves to be poor, they consider themselves to be on the pathway to riches. Now, fundamentally, of course, nobody knows how to live. Nobody knows what to do with themselves or with their life. Whether you want to be a writer, an artist, a teacher, an athlete, you look towards role models to essentially help you determine how to live your own life. And what's important here is that here we have one version of the Lacanian subject who is supposed to know. This is why the old maxim that you should never meet your heroes is true. Because the role that your heroes play for you isn't that they're actually giving you a sense of how to live your life. Instead, you're using them as an idea to give you a framework of reality that can serve as an inspiration for how you would like to lead yours. Fundamentally, therefore, if you came too close to them, if you actually got to know them and realized that they too were simply individuals who were struggling and who didn't know what they were doing, this power of their image would therefore be dispelled. Fundamentally, of course, the central truth, therefore, is that we're all trying to figure it out, that nobody knows exactly what they're doing. And there is some hope to be gained from this, I would say. However, from a Lacanian's perspective, the subject who is supposed to know is quite important. The subject who is supposed to know is the key, let's say, catalyst for what Lacan calls transference. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you want to learn something. Let's say that you go to a classroom because you'd like to learn from your professor. This exchange has to be initiated by the notion that the professor knows more than you that they have some secret that they can share with you, that they can transfer their knowledge to you. In other words, the educator is the one who is supposed to know, and you see yourself as the receiving subject. However, what Lacan essentially points out is that whilst this may be true, fundamentally, the education is only successful at the exact point at which you become disillusioned from this idea. In other words, at the exact point that you no longer see your tutor or your mentor as this perfect sage who can tell you exactly how to live, this is when you too have become a master. This is when you too have learned. 
In other words, transference occurs successfully at the exact moment that you no longer see the subject as being the one who knows, because now it is you who has to step in on your own accord. And think about it, this is true when it comes to your relationship to your parents as well. When you're a child, you believe that your parents are all-knowing, that they have the solution to everything. And yet, as you grow up, you realize that your parents are also mere mortals, and that they were trying, just as much as anybody else, to raise you. And so it's up to you to step into that breach, into that void, to essentially assume your own maturity and start making your own decisions. You could say the same is true when it comes to politics. A lot of us believe that political decision-making is something that simply happens somewhere out of our reach, that we're fundamentally powerless. This is the cynical position. In other words, we believe that other people know for us, that other people have the answers, that they're capable of coming up with the most reasonable decisions that will impact our life. And yet, once you realize that this is not the case, that everyone is, in a sense, simply making it up as they go along, it really comes down to you to step in and to actualize your own life, to be part of the political decision-making process in whatever way you see fit. In other words, the beginning of an authentic, mature subjectivity is precisely when you realize that the subject who is supposed to know does not know. There's something very human and very collective and leveling about this, something very humble and humane, which is understanding that the person that you imbued this idealized knowledge with is in fact flawed in the exact same way that you are. And this is an empowering notion because at that point you realize that you too could do it. Let's say you walk into an art gallery and you say to yourself that famous, that famous expression, oh, I could make this. Instead of seeing that as a pejorative, as in anyone could do this, this is precisely an emancipatory declaration. I too could do this. In fact, I too might make the decision to dedicate my life to creating art. When you read books, you'll, go, you'll get to a certain point in your reading where you start thinking, I have things to say. I could put this into words. It's also true fundamentally when it comes to teaching, that to truly master what you're learning, you have to pass it on to others. You go from being a student to being a teacher, and therein you've essentially mastered your knowledge. Think about an athlete who has a role model and then finds himself playing on the exact same team as the person he used to idolize and perhaps even beating them. This transference, this continual exchange, is therefore the process by which we imbue an other with an idealized subjective position of knowledge or expertise so as to create the gap in which you can create and discover yourself. And as you will then recognize that others will do the exact same thing for you. They'll start trying to copy you, or they'll start trying to mimic your mannerisms, etc. They'll start asking you how you read or how you do something in your life. And so we always think that somebody else has it figured out, that they have some kind of recipe, and we can create coordinates in our own life drawing upon this, but fundamentally it is up to us to step into that gap. Now when it comes to symbolic identification, you therefore realize the importance of the subject who is supposed to know. Whether the subject who is supposed to know is the father figure, whether the subject who is supposed to know is the president, whether the subject who is supposed to know is the religious leader in your community. The central question, therefore, as I said before, <clears throat> which begins and underlies the critique of ideology, is therefore, who am I in relationship to this figure of authority, in relationship to this figure who is supposed to know? Once you start understanding that your own subjectivity is created by the gap between you and the idealized symbolic other, this is in itself an act of resistance. It means that you can, as Kant once said, choose your own master. It's one of my favorite Kantian maxims that man is an animal in search of a master. In other words, you don't simply have a master, you are looking for one. You are looking for a master to follow so as to step into the breach of your own subjective potential. However, what's important here is that you therefore don't act merely as the person who is the disciple or the acolyte of the master. In other words, you would have the master inhabit the empty space, which allows you to not do that. Instead, you are the one who has to step into that gap, who has to ask the poignant question, who am I and what would I like to do? Now, Fundamentally, Lacan actually uses this idea of the subject who's supposed to know in relationship to analysis, to psychoanalysis. That when the analysant, or however you pronounce this, goes into the 
um, relationship with the analyst, he has to presume that the, an that the analyst has some secret answer to his symptoms, that the analyst has some wisdom or some technique which he can use to uncover what you or he, the analyzant, is experiencing at that moment. Now, what's crucial here from a Lacanian perspective is that this is true even if you don't believe in the analyst's perceived wisdom. In other words, you could go into the room and believe that the analyst has no clue that he's a charlatan or a buffoon. And yet, strictly speaking, in the exchange between you and this other who either has an imaginary knowledge or an imaginary lack of knowledge, you've already created the circumstances for the discovery of that which could only be actualized through the symbolic exchange. And Lacan points out here that vice versa, the analyst thinks that you're the one who's supposed to know. The analyst is the one who has an unnecessary optimism that if you begin to speak, Freud's famous talking therapy, that there will be something to be revealed, that there is something to be unearthed. Now, from a structuralist perspective, what's important here, therefore, is that there's no truth that lies behind this expression. There's no a priori truth to your symptoms, no a priori expertise or knowledge, some wisdom that the analyst has. Instead, the truth is the truth of the structural exchange itself, the structural possibility that is created in the exchange between the subject and the subject who is supposed to know. This is why Slavoj Žižek actually has three additions that he makes to the idea of the subject who is supposed to know. He adds the subject who is supposed to believe, the subject who's supposed to enjoy, and the subject who's supposed to desire. Let's begin with the subject who's supposed to believe. For Zizek, the subject who is supposed to believe is the person you believe will act in a certain way. Let me give you an example. During the, uh, the COVID shortages of toilet paper, nobody really thought that there would be a shortage of toilet paper, at least not if everybody bought a reasonable amount of toilet paper. And yet, most people acted on the assumption that other people would believe that there would be a shortage of toilet paper and that therefore they would be hoarding it, ergo, why you should be hoarding it yourself. In other words, everyone started acting on the belief that the other would be behaving in a naive way as if there were a shortage, thereby, of course, creating the very structural reality of said shortage, which would have never existed without this anticipation of the other's belief which is another way of saying that here we have the subject who is supposed to believe. You are buying something because you believe that the other believes there is a shortage. In other words, your belief is sustained by an imaginary belief that you ascribe to the other. And ironically, in this mutual imaginary sustained belief, you create the very thing which should not have existed or been believed in in the first place. Ironically, this, this is exactly how faith works, how religion works. As Chesterton once wrote, when you pray, you're strictly speaking praying on behalf of everybody else. You're not simply sending a missive to God. You're strictly speaking praying and believing in God on behalf of the community of the faithful itself. In other words, you think to yourself, if I pray and if I go to church and if everybody else were to go to church, then fundamentally, collectively, we would have enacted the very truth of the religious community, which is that the spirit resides in the uh, community of the faithful. In other words, you step into this breach subjectively because you know that others will as well, and therefore you do it for each other. And What's fundamentally important here is that you're doing it on behalf of the subject who is supposed to believe, who therefore becomes, vice versa, yourself. I'm currently in Germany, and we can see an ideological version of this in Germany when it comes to recycling. In Germany, recycling is considered to be very important. Of course, recycling is important, but as a social phenomenon, it's particularly visible in Germany that the separation of müll, of, of trash, into different bins different levels of recycling is therefore not simply speaking, strictly speaking, something one does alone because one believes in it, one does it on behalf of everybody else. In other words, one performs the act of intense separation of trash on behalf of the ideal that everybody else is doing it as well. Therefore, 
Not to separate your trash becomes not just a crime against the environment, it becomes a crime against the social order itself. That, in a sense, it doesn't matter. For example, here I was staying, where we were staying, the person said, yes, we separate the trash, but we know it all gets burnt in the exact same place anyway. This is the truth of the subject who is supposed to believe. We are all separating the trash, knowing that in this particular community, this rural community, the trash will be burnt anyway, and yet we do it on behalf of everybody else who is also doing it. It's important to note here that this isn't merely solidarity. It's not merely saying, my situation differs from yours, but I'm choosing to find unity. It's specifically that we exist as a group, as a society, as a collective, and therefore to ourselves, by means of participating in this thing we don't believe in, but we believe on behalf of the idea of belief itself. I actually saw, this is a bit random, but I saw a beautiful TikTok about this. It was a German TikTok in which a young man uh, was trying to recycle a pizza box. And the, and the music for the clip was the uh, Hans Zimmer score for Oppenheimer. And essentially the pizza box presented this young man with an impossible dilemma, which was, did he put it in the paper trash or the parts of the pizza box that contained fat and residue of the pizza, did he put it in the regular trash? I guess it's the grüne Tonne and the schwarze Tonne or whatever you call it in Germany. And he's totally stumped by this problem, this sublime dilemma, to put it in a Kantian perspective, the antinomies of the pizza box. And he figures out that he can cut around the greasy pieces and therefore separate the pizza box adequately into the containers. And at this point, the music swells and the, the, uh, the, it essentially becomes a pun on Oppenheimer that he solves some kind of equation when it comes to, uh, when it comes to human existence and, and, and on some kind of atomic level. Fundamentally, however, there's a truth to this, which is to say that it's precisely this symbolic manner in which the recycling takes place through which the subject is created. In other words, to be a little bit melodramatic, one could go as far as saying that in Germany, one is interpolated through waste management, that through waste management, the idea of society is fundamentally sustained, and therefore the idea of ourselves participating in said society. But of course, this is where very quickly we can have a let's say, discriminatory and, of course, imaginary stance on the supposed other who does not participate in this practice. This is the problem of tolerance. The idea of tolerance is always that you are in the superior moral position from which you can tolerate others. Therefore, tolerance, which is supposed to be the symbolic or the signifier of a, a collective acceptance becomes exactly the opposite. It becomes the manner in which you deem other people's practices as being somehow inferior to yours and therefore tolerable. In other words, the question is who gets to tolerate whom and why is something considered tolerable whereas something else is not? And this is how we go from the subject who is supposed to believe to the subject who is supposed to enjoy. Slavoj Žižek has argued that the subject who is supposed to enjoy lies at the heart of most racist or discriminatory fantasies. Let's go back to the pizza box. The pizza box could be, oh, we go through the, we go through the trouble of recycling. And because we go through the trouble of recycling, this is important and we are virtuous. But this is supplemented by the idea that there is an other who enjoys who simply eats pizza without this moral dilemma, who simply throws the trash in the general trash depository. Therefore, the subject who is supposed to enjoy is the subject who exists as the antithesis, the internal limit of the subject who is supposed to believe. Think about it. Let's say that you're the subject who is supposed to believe is the subject who goes to church and prays on behalf of everybody else. But this is only sustained by the idea that there are those who do not go to pray. And therefore, you are praying on behalf of them as well. This is always the slightly pedantic undertone of the idea that you are praying for someone. Because the idea that you're praying for them, therefore, belies the idea that they're not necessarily praying for themselves, that they need to be prayed for, that they're not part of the community. Hence, the subject who is supposed to enjoy is therefore the subject who is imaginarily constituted by being exempt from the subject who is supposed to believe. And the discriminatory racist fantasy is therefore often that the other 
who is not part of the ethnic social symbolic system of the majority, the autochthonous population, is therefore the one who enjoys, but who doesn't contribute. This is the classic uh, uh, anti-immigrant sentiment, that they benefit from all of our, supposedly, social institutions, but they don't contribute to them, and perhaps more grievously, they don't ideologically ascribe to their importance, that they are therefore essentially opportunistically taking from us that which they do not deserve to have. That is the subject who is supposed to enjoy and why the subject who is supposed to enjoy is attached at the hip to the idea of the subject who is supposed to believe. Finally, we have the subject who is supposed to desire. And here's how we loop back to the idea of hysteria. Remember, Slavoj Žižek argues that hysteria is not a bad thing. Hysteria can be a good thing. After all, the central hysterical question is, who am I to the other? And why should I be something to the other? For example, the, 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 the easy example of hysteria is when you're in love. When you're in love with somebody, you ask yourself, are they in love with me? This can be extremely disruptive, right? It's like you're going through your life and you're perfectly happy, you're content, because you feel comfortable with who you are. You've practiced, you know, the contemporary obsession of self-love. You're taking care of yourself. You're sleeping well, etc. And then you find somebody who completely destabilizes you because suddenly you want to appeal to them. You want to be loved by them. You want them to return your affectionate gaze. And so you start tormenting yourself. You start asking yourself, what can I do to win their affection? What do I need to say? What do I need to wear? Do I need to go online to research their favorite movies on Facebook so that I can pretend I've seen those movies as well? Essentially, you start betraying yourself. You start becoming someone who you're not because you'd like to be with that other person. And it's insufficient at this point to simply say, well, you should be yourself. You should be your authentic true self because when you're in love, whether you want it or not, whether you like it or not, you start behaving differently. You start becoming more awkward. You start second guessing how what you're saying is going to be interpreted by that person. In other words, it becomes a kind of madness. It's Nietzsche's, ma Nietzsche's maxim that there is no love without a touch of madness, and yet there is no reason without some madness, turns out to be quite true here, which is that love presents itself as a kind of fundamental structural undermining of the security of one's own subjective position within the symbolic identity that you have created for yourself. The other person, therefore, has power over you. It's why a lot of people, I think, when confronted with a crush or falling in love, actually become a little bit angry at that person. It's like, if your entire identity is about control, then you've suddenly ceded control to that other person, because now you feel like you're incomplete unless you're with them, which is, of course, not a good way to live your life. And so fundamentally, the question of hysteria in a relationship or when in love presents itself as, who do I need to be in order to be loved? Do you really love me? Is therefore the central hysterical question. It can't be proved. It's also why Lacan writes that it's the most dangerous question because it's an, a question with an impossible answer. If you say, do you really love me? You've already created a trap for your loved one. Because if they say, yes, I love you, then you could accuse them of simply trying to appease you. You're just saying you love me because I forced you to say that, because I asked you. Instead, you start laying traps for them. You start laying traps for them that are supposed to prove or disprove whether or not they really care for you. In other words, the very question, do they really love me, cannot be answered, save in the negative. That even the affirmation, yes, I love you, becomes a way of undermining the very truth of said statement. That love, therefore, cannot be directly signified because what you love is the idea of the love in the other. Now, what this means from the perspective of, of, of the hysteric subject and the subject supposed to desire is that, therefore, the subject supposed to desire is the subject who is supposed to love you on behalf of love itself. To put that a little bit more simply, when you're in love with somebody, you think that they're the person who is supposed to know whether or not they truly love you. Think about it. A lot of people start relationships they're not entirely certain whether or not they want to commit, if it's really going to work out. And so we look for that certainty, ironically, in the other. We think, well, if they really love me, then I can allow myself to love them. 
In other words, we posit an unexisting certainty because love is, of course, the embrace of precisely said uncertainty. After all, what is, what is trust if not the ability to act and interact without any sense of security a priori or in advance? Love is therefore two people stepping into the breach of this unknown possibility, love as pure possibility or pure instability, if you will, anticipating that the other person will know what to do. I will participate in this relationship on the assumption that you are in love with me as I am in love with you, and since neither of us can prove this to each other, we're simply going to have to fall in love with each other over and over again, each and every day, in new and different ways. In other words, there is no concrete signifier of love. You can't say this is the thing that represents love for us and simply put it aside. The closest that we get, of course, are symbolic substitutes, like wearing a ring if you're married. And yet, once again, the critique of ideology comes into, into, into place here, which is that the, if the ring is supposed to be the substitute of love, namely the idea of a love which is sanctioned within the institutional ideolo ideology of the church and the state, then is it really love? And the answer is, therefore, that there is no concrete marker of love. There are no amount of flowers you can send that represent love. There's no amount of jewelry you can gift each other that makes love. Love is, of course, sublime precisely in this way. Love is the thing that has no concrete signifier that marks it as being complete or accomplished. Love, therefore, to be a little bit um, uh, obtuse here, love is a form of failure. You have to love each and every day and try better each and every day. As Samuel Beckett wrote, you have to fail and then fail again and fail better. In other words, there is no success save for the embrace of this failure. And you stick it out together and you call it success. Therefore, the hysterical question is, do they love me in a concrete sense? What is the thing that they can do or say or buy that will prove their love for me? When the truth of the love lies precisely in the fact that the exchange can never be completed. Or, to go back to the subject who is supposed to know, once you realize that your teacher doesn't actually know any, uh, everything, this is how you can step into the breach and learn and teach yourself. The same is true with love. At the exact point that you realize that your partner isn't the person who has the truth or the secret to love, you realize that you have to step into the breach and participate in this act of love, which is therefore the act of futility of love, yourself. Fundamentally, therefore, it's an emancipatory structure. Because let's look at the structural relationship between each of these. The subject who is supposed to believe participates in a collective behavior because he posits a believing other. Then we have the subject who is supposed to enjoy, the subject who therefore identifies as being part of a collective by positing an other who enjoys against the belief of the other. And finally, the subject who is supposed to desire, the subject who is supposed to love or desire concretely or purely in a way that is barred from me. Hence, what's important here from a Lacanian perspective is that love is always the idea of love in the other. Belief is always the idea of belief of the other. And enjoyment is the idea of the enjoyment in the other. That fundamentally we're barred from it. And now you can start understanding why Zizek argues that enjoyment, the subject presumed to enjoy, is, is, is represented by obsessional neurosis, whereas hysteria is the subject who is supposed to desire or love. Obsessional neurosis is that there is something that you find to be perpetually outside of your reach. For example, let's say that you're a collector, and there's one thing that's missing in your collection. You'll never be able to rest. You'll never be able to look at your collection until you have that one thing, the thing that is supposed to signify the completion of your collection. Now, of course, we already have here the sublime paradox, which is that as soon as you would complete your collection, you would have lost the enjoyment of it. It would have been complete. The very pleasure from the, from the collector's perspective, of course, always derives from the possibility of there being another thing to collect, another thing to enjoy. This is also why collecting is one of the key imperatives of the consumer economy. Create a limited amount of certain things, therefore create the idea or, or the, the, the desire of, of, a, uh, of scarcity, and therefore you have created a more valuable product that people will want to purchase. For example, the German company Playmobil, which is doing very, very poorly in the, in the children's and, and adult toy market, recently decided that they would start making their Playmobil collectible. Uh, in Germany, you will see stars on the Christmas market, these big stars that are hanging everywhere in the trees. These two are now collectible, and there are drops in certain 
color schemes that you can only get resold on eBay for 2,000 euros, etc. In other words, the value lies precisely in this objet A, in this empty space of not being able to complete your collection. There's always something else that is missing that creates more value precisely by, by being, being uh, something that is, that is scarce. Manufactured scarcity, as behavioral economics would call it. And fundamentally, therefore, what's important is that the obsessional neurotic believes that there is a point of enjoyment that he is barred from. In the same way that the person who recycles does it on behalf of the idea of the hedonistic person who doesn't recycle, the person who uh, uh, is obsessionally neurotic believes that some point or horizon of pure enjoyment exists that he is perpetually barred from. This is similar to the, 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 the famous passage in, in Kafka in, in the trial uh, where the man spends his entire life in front of the gate and he's barred from what lies behind the gate. And finally, when the man is is about to breathe his last breath, having expired his entire life waiting for this moment of entry, the guard of the gate walks over to him and whispers in his ears, the gate was only ever meant for you. From a Lacanian perspective, this is how all subjectivity works. That subjectivity lies precisely beyond, beyond the horizon of this inaccessible objet petit a, this inaccessible uh, domain of desire itself. Hence why from a Lacanian Hegelian, to add Hegel here, position, subjectivity is precisely what lies beyond this nothingness. That what you find beyond the gate isn't the object that completes your collection or the horizon of your desire. You find the subject. The subject exists in this nothing as nothing refracted back onto itself. Now, from the position of hysteria, the subject who is supposed to desire, we see a similar process, which is that the subject who is supposed to desire, let's say the lover who truly loves you, is the person who is supposed to believe in love on behalf of love itself, and yet the person who is supposed to complete you, this person who is supposed to lie beyond the horizon of enjoyment. It's like when you're in a relationship, one of the traps you can fall into, therefore, is that you make your happiness dependent on theirs. And you, so you try to make them happy all the time because you think, well, if they're happy, then I know how to be happy as well which doesn't mean that you shouldn't make each other happy, but it means that if your happiness is conditional upon the performance of their own autonomous, pure happiness, then you've fallen into the trap of believing in the idea of a happiness which is not reflected, refracted through its own impossibility, which I already called love. Two people who make each other unhappy but enjoy this unhappiness as love. I should briefly say, because people will misinterpret me, as, as happens sometimes, when I say make each other unhappy, I don't mean being terrible to each other. I mean... Be failing at love and doing it with one person and enjoying this failure. Anyway, back to my point. The subject who is supposed to know is therefore not the fourth in a sequence of the subject who is supposed to desire and enjoy and believe. They all fundamentally follow the same structural proposition. The subject who is supposed to know is therefore the subject who is supposed to believe in your stead, who is supposed to enjoy in your stead, who is supposed to desire in your stead. And think about it, if you have a master figure, whether it's a mentor, whether it's a teacher, whether it's an analyst, the idea is that they believe in the idea of learning for you. This is also why I think it's quite true that as an educator, it's more important that you teach people the joy of learning rather than simply the information that can be learned. It's also why you imagine that your role model is the person who enjoys it and believes it and therefore desires it for you. And through this, we access the horizon of our own belief and enjoyment and desire. It's like we watch artists who dedicate their life to their craft, who have the discipline to make themselves subject to their passion. And we admire them for it. And so we feign to do it ourselves. We find the courage to do it ourselves. We look at great relationships and we find in it the courage to love ourselves. We look at great political figures and we see in them the possibility of our own potential as a society and as a community. This is what it means to be subject, not to have it figured out, but to realize the structural truth of the subject who is supposed to know and to step in this gap, to say, I will believe in my own stead on behalf of everybody else. I will enjoy in my own stead on behalf of everybody else. I will desire in my own stead on behalf of everybody else. And I will know in my stead on behalf of everybody else. That therefore the emancipatory potential of who am I 
and why should I be X isn't simply about questioning the symbolic identity that is given to you as supposedly natural and fixed by ideological interpolation, but precisely the questioning of the structural relationship to the supposed a priori nature of your subjectivity and the supposed given nature of the person who believes or acts or desires and enjoys in your, in your place. To simplify, the most important question you can ask yourself, therefore, is what is it that I would like to have the responsibility to be and to do? What am I going to do with the time that is given to me? If I'm going to write or teach or create or dream, I know I will fail and yet I will embrace my failure and I will do it again. This means that every act of will, as Chesterton once wrote, is fundamentally an act of self-discipline. Holding yourself accountable, believing that you can do something worthwhile, means having discipline. It means being serious. Being serious about what you do. If you go into a relationship, be serious about it. Show the other person that they matter and that you matter. Have self-respect by means of committing to something. Be serious about your reading. Be serious about your passions. If you love wine and cheese, don't apologize for it. If you're passionate about French cinema, don't apologize for it. Embracing your passions and having the discipline not just to be a consumer of it, but a creator of it, namely a participant in the tradition of it. This is the ultimate act of self-liberation. Namely, I will create myself not by means of being an educated consumer, but by means of being an educated participant in the traditions which I find to be important. This can be a religious institutional tradition. This can be an educational tradition. This can be a political tradition. This can be an artistic tradition. Fundamentally identifying that to which you would like to dedicate yourself with seriousness is therefore the most serious question you can ask yourself. Doesn't mean you should punish yourself. Doesn't mean that you have to be without humor. But it does mean that the ultimate act of freedom is deciding what it is you would like to be responsible for. What in your life is so important that you want to make it your priority? And when you make it a priority, then the barriers to success disappear. Fundamentally, and I don't mean to be a self-help person here, but I believe that this is very true. Being serious about what you do and being unapologetic as to the importance of what you do and the life that you are building for yourself is an act of resistance. Showing people that you care, that you care about your work, that you care about them, is important because we model to others the importance of care. Being unafraid to be passionate, to be earnest, to be committed, is the ultimate romantic ideal. That there are things that are worth fighting for, there are things that are worth believing in, and above all, that there are things that are worth persisting in, precisely because they don't come easily. That the society of instant gratification is therefore the society of complete restriction. And once you embrace and enjoy the project, which is your life, that is where you find happiness. That is how you become the subject who is supposed to know to others. On that note, I wish you all a Merry Christmas. Thank you for joining me today. That was my lecture on the subject who is supposed to know. And please, if you'd like to download my lectures and contribute to these um, I don't know, live stream sessions and download my ebooks, please go to www.patreon.com forward slash Julian Philosophy. I will see you all next week. Bye.